Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truths of your word. Thank you for the time we're living in. God, we're glad we're living in a time when we're seeing your word fulfilled. Father, we're also glad that, uh, that you have brought each person here. It's not by accident or by chance that they're here, but Lord, you've brought them here for a purpose. Nobody ever comes to Quinault by accident. They either come here to vacation and leave, or they come here because uh, by divine appointment, because you have a work for them. So, Father, we thank you for each one, and we pray now that your hand would be upon each of us as we listen to you. And, Father, I pray that you'd cause our minds and our hearts to open up to receive your word this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was preparing and praying and thinking about the message this morning, I, I was... Uh, I had a thought that 2012, the summer of 2012 and the fall of 2012 may very well be the summer of decision. There's, this is a time as we get closer and closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and I believe that Jesus is going to come back through the clouds of glory as, as the disciples seen him go. The word, my word, my Bible tells me that he's going to return in like manner. I'm believing that, looking forward to that. Um, I'm trying to encourage you with that word because the Bible says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And I want to bring you comfort in the fact that Jesus is going to return to this earth in a literal form. Somebody's teaching that truth or the, the, the belief that Jesus is going to come back in his collective church and that we're just going to get better and better until we usher in the millennium and uh, Jesus won't have to come back in person and it's just we're going to make it all happen. Let me tell you what, that's not what the Bible says, that's just what they hope to happen. If ever you needed to know what God's word says, you need to know it now. If ever you needed to believe the truth and be and hear the truth and walk in the truth, now is the time. There is so many things coming at you that are not true. And even in the even in the Christian world, you know, it doesn't mean that they have to lie to you. All they have to do is tell you a half truth. Or even just emphasize one point way overboard and ignore the other ones. And it, it brings about a uh, an untruth in your life. Some people are living in doctrines that are not true just because the doctrine is true. I don't know if you remember years and years ago, there was a, a group called, we called them the name it and claim it folks. Okay. They found a Bible truth that was a good truth. Kenneth Hagin came on a Bible truth that was a good truth. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I don't know which was first, but Oral Roberts hopped on the same bandwagon and said, if you just sow a little seed, it'll just grow and, it'll, and all this will happen. Okay. True. God's word says it. It's true. But if that's all you preach, pretty soon you get a bunch of people that's looking forward to prosperity and not even aware of the fact that there's a whole other four-fifths of the Bible that needs to be listened to. God help us not to go overboard in one area, but not and not tell the whole truth. Okay? We just, I, I thank Rusty for finishing Colossians, but we're going to go back there for a minute uh, as, we, as we look here this morning. Colossians, little book in your New Testament. If you haven't been there lately, you'll, you'll find it over there right after Philippians and probably before Thessalonians. But Colossians, the third chapters, was about where I left off. Um, and uh, the third chapter, Paul, of course, was speaking to the whole family, wasn't he? He spoke to the wives first, submit yourselves to your husbands. He spoke to the husbands, love your wives. He spoke to the children, obey your parents. Then you know what he did? He went back to the fathers. Husbands and fathers, he went back to the fathers and gave them an extra charge. He said, fathers, you've got an extra responsibility. Well, now we know that that's fathers and mothers both that have that responsibility. And in our society, many times it's the mother that ends up raising the children. 
maybe the father isn't even in the home. Or if he is, he's working so hard, he doesn't show up very often. Fathers, you have a responsibility. I'm glad that our church has lots of men in it. And I'm glad for men that are real men and men of God. And glad to stand up and claim that I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and I'm living for Jesus. And I'm not going to compromise. But I want to, I want to tell you something, fathers. We have a responsibility for our children, for our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. We have a responsibility that doesn't stop just because they turn 18 years old and we encourage them to leave home. Just because that happens, it doesn't stop our responsibility for our children. We still love them, we still care for them, and we still pray for them and encourage them. But ultimately, the responsibility for the home lies with the mother and father, ultimately with the father, if the father's there. If the father isn't there, then it lies with the mother. And God made arrangements and made, um, made a plan for that too. But um, I just want you to realize that where we're going, I'm going to probably step on a couple toes. So I just want you to know where the responsibility lies, all right? Because I stepped, I stepped on my own toes. But uh, before we get to that, I want to just take you on into the next chapter, chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 2. Chapter 4 of Colossians, verse 2 says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in, a, in it with thanksgiving. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. The Bible says in King James, it says, Watch. How come we pray with our eyes closed? Huh? To focus? To focus on Jesus? Okay. I was doing a f uh, graveside service last Friday up at the cemetery. Got to a very solemn point. Said, shall we pray? Everybody bowed their heads and started praying, I thought. I started praying. And all of a sudden, I heard a commotion back there. And I'm thinking, who would do that at a funeral when I'm praying? I'm talking to God. The family's all here, sitting up here in the front. Who would do something like that? I opened my eyes, because I had my eyes closed. I opened my eyes, and I realized it was Bob, the funeral director. He had had his eyes open and saw a spider crawling up a guy's neck. And he thought it was going to bite him. No, it wasn't that spider over there. That's our pet spider up there. We just keep it there. But Tony, it hasn't even moved. Did it a little bit? Okay. That spider up there is not a danger to anyone, I, I want you to know. But the spider apparently crawling up the guy's neck was a danger, and Bob slapped it off. I was glad he was, I'm glad he was awake and paying attention and had his eyes open, and so was the guy in front of him. I asked him if he couldn't behave himself, and he said uh, yes, and I told him that when I was preaching and praying, I was used to people going to sleep, but very seldom cutting up. So uh, anyway, anyway. Uh, but we need to watch and pray. The Bible earnestly sa or the Bible says that uh, we're to continue earnestly in prayer. And I would say not just prayer, because everybody prays, don't they? I mean, even the, even the ungodly, when they get in a tight fix. I had a guy tell me the other day, I prayed, I just prayed today and God didn't do anything. <laughs> My response was, I don't blame him, but I didn't, I didn't say that. But, uh, but you know, everybody, I, most everybody prays, but there's praying, and then there's praying. Praying earnestly is different than just saying, God, I need help. Um, I would like to speak this morning about intercessory prayer with spiritual warfare. And now I'm getting around to talking to the fathers. Will, 
you have a wonderful family, Grady and that precious boy Noah and a beautiful daughter. If for some reason somebody came to your home, came into your home with the intent to hurt one of your little ones or to harm your wife, I know you're a peaceable man. For the most part, <laughs> I think you would probably rise up and stop that if you possibly could, wouldn't you? Even if it meant physical violence. I, I chose you because I know you didn't have your gun loaded probably, <laughs> so you wouldn't shoot them maybe. But maybe you would because it's your, it's your responsibility to protect your family. And I would expect you to do that. And God would expect you to do that. I would say to you, fathers, there has been in the recent years an entity that's come into our homes, into our schools, into our very lives, stolen away our children, corrupted our homes, caused divorce, caused all these things, and we have set by and let it happen. We've been in Ephesians, the sixth chapter in our Bible study, and uh, on Wednesday nights, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, well, let's turn to it, then I won't quote it incorrectly. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, for we wrestle not. Most people's, many, many, many men of God stop right there. For we wrestle not. We don't go any farther than that because we just live a nice, Christian, comfortable, godly little life. While everything we have that we care about is being stolen away. I'm preaching from my own, my own self, guys. I'm not just, I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying. Guys and gals, moms, you're in this too. Older brothers and sisters, you're in this too. Paul didn't aim that second verse of Colossians to any particular people. He just said, pray. But I would say that we wrestle not against flesh and blood or against principalities and powers. We just don't wrestle at all. We don't climb through the, the ropes and into the ring and wrestle a bit. We're content to let the enemy take what we have and do what he wants to with it. And that's why our kids are on drugs and our, our young men are on alcohol and we're, we're losing the battle and people are going out into immorality and all the other things that go along with it is because we have been content to stay out of the ring and let it happen. I am really tired of it. I very seldom ever get worked up, but I'll tell you what, yesterday a guy came to me in the morning, he walked right up to me and said, well he called me first and then he, uh, he showed up just a little while later, if I'd have known he was coming I would have left, but I didn't know it. He walked right up to me and looked me right in the eye and he said, I'm leaving. Okay, where are you going? said, I'm going to get my 45 and I'm going to shoot myself. I'm going to kill myself. So being not too smart, I stepped over to see if he'd been drinking, and he had a little bit, but it was early in the morning. We don't take something like that lightly. No matter who says it, no matter what, no matter how many times they say it, we don't take that lightly. I said... If you do, you will go to hell and burn for eternity. He said, this is hell. I said, because you've made it hell. You don't have to make it that way. 
I said, if you would accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and allow him to make a change in your life, there's a way out of this situation that you're in. I said, there's three ways out. You have three choices that I can see. One is you can shoot yourself. And maybe you will, and I hope and pray that you don't. Number two is you can continue in the same miserable existence that you've been in for the last six months that I've known you. Number three, you can give up all this, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and go to the cross or go to a discipleship place, get your life clean, and be a wonderful guy that I know you can be. He has those three potentials. Totally, totally, totally snared by alcoholism to the point to where nothing else matters except alcohol and drugs. People look at, look, I mean, I, I look at him and I think, why in the world don't you change? But the truth is, the enemy has got such a stronghold in his life that he couldn't change if he wanted to. And he does want to. And without a miracle taking place, he's not going to change. And unless somebody steps into the ring and begins to wrestle and contend for that man's salvation, he's going to go to hell and go into eternity without the Lord Jesus Christ. That's just one. I can tell you about our children and our grandchildren. I can talk to you about our cousins and relatives, and you know them all around you. And I'm telling you, folks, we have not began to fight. You remember the old John Paul Jones thing when, it, when his ship was burning and going down. They yelled across to him and said, do you surrender? He said, I've not yet begun to fight. It's about time the church stood up and said, I've not yet begun to fight. It's sad to say that we believe that the gates of hell are preventing us from going into hell. And we... The church has, have not marched on the gates of hell. We have allowed ourselves to become so reactionary that we don't take action. We just react when the enemy does something to us. It's time, if this is truly going to be a summer of decision, it's time that we do something about it. Okay, our warfare is not with a person. So we don't fight because we, we can't see them. I mean, if, it, if you were going to come over and do something to my, to my wife or my kids or even my dog, I'd punch you right in the lip. <laughs> and I wouldn't let you come in the house. But because I can't see the enemy, I don't do any battle with him because where is he and what is he doing? And I can't, you know, I can't figure all this out. And so I just sit back and say, I'm going to go to heaven. And I sure wish my kids and my family did. And Lord, would you bless them wherever they are and take care of them? And I guess that's the best I can do. Because to make it even more complicated, I don't even know the weapon. I don't even know the weapons that I'm fighting with. Because the Bible says in... 1 Corinthians, let's turn there, 2 Corinthians, let's turn to 2 Corinthians. You need to follow along with me, guys, because this, this, is, this is serious. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I had a really good sermon about tearing down mobile homes, and I really wanted to preach it because I'm good at tearing down mobile homes. I wanted to preach that this morning, and I have to preach this one instead. 10, 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. I know how to load a gun. I know how to swing a club. And I wouldn't hit you with my right hand because it would hurt too bad. But I know how to do those kind of things. But it says here, my weapons are not carnal. They're not made that way. What kind of weapons are we talking about? Are they any good? Do they work? It says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. For pulling down strongholds. For tearing down those places in people's lives that have such a stronghold. 
that lust, that pornography, that whatever it is that the person is into, if we know and we come before God and do battle in the heavenlies, I'm, I'm going to go to some other scripture here we're going to need to look at here in a couple minutes, but if we look just a little bit farther, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled, Paul was not a wimp. You know what Paul said in that last phrase right there? He said, if you guys don't shape up, I'm going to come down here and straighten you out myself. Read it and look, look, at, look between the lines a little bit. I'm ready to punish, punish all disobedience. As soon as you get your life squared away, then I'll square, I'll square away the ones that didn't, don't come around. But he says that we have the ability, we have the uh, weapons to bring every thought into captivity. We have the weapons to cast down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We have those weapons. Do we use them? Do we tear down strongholds in our own lives and in the lives of other people? I challenge you that we are not very often stronghold terror downers. We'd rather not even look at them. And if we see them, we would rather not deal with them. Today, there are two beautiful young ladies from our church going through maybe the hardest time of their life. They're at the cross. I don't know if I'm supposed to say this or not, but I don't think they'd mind if I say this. They're going through a hard time. One of them decided to come home. It was too hard. She decided to come home, and I got a call from the leadership, and they said, uh, the leadership said, what's wrong with the people in your area? I said, man, you don't have time for that <laughs> question. They said, why in the world would they think they know what more than everybody else, and why did they bother to come if they think they are already fixed? And I said, I don't know. I said, well, this gal's coming home. Stepped away from the phone when I hung it up. And I said, God, only you can take care of this. I can't fix it if it's in her heart to come home. They've already rolled her up. She's, that's the phrase they use. They've rolled up her gear, and she's already going out, and she's getting on a bus and headed downtown Tacoma to catch another bus to come on out, to come back home. I said, God, only you can do this. You know what God did? About the time she got in the middle of the coma, God broke her heart. She grabbed a phone and called her right back and said, I'm coming right back. Will you have me back? And of course, they took her right back. She's right back there today, going ahead. But the battle is raging, folks. You think when they go up there, the battle's won? No, the battle just intensifies when they get there. The first month there is a tremendous battle for the souls and the, the very welfare of those people because the enemy kicks up a fuss when they get in there. He starts really turning on the pressure. And then they've got to go through withdrawals, all the things that they go through, and they're going through it in a place where they've got a whole bunch of other weirdos around them. And I mean, it's strange, let me tell you. And they don't realize it, but they're fitting in all too well. But the truth is, as they go through this, sometimes we, as the body of Christ, choose to say, well, bless the Lord, they're up there just getting fixed. I'll just go on and pray for somebody else. If ever we were to go to our knees, we need to go to our knees for Amber and uh, uh, Lena right now and pray for their Pray for them to get through this time and for them to get totally healed inside and outside so they can come back and serve God with their whole heart. We've seen it happen. We know the victories. We've got some sitting in our church. We've got some in our community that we know are serving God today because we've seen them go through it. But somebody stayed on their knees and prayed till they got through all that. April, did you pray for a while? Kay, did you pray for a while? Mothers and mother-in-laws praying, interceding before God. I know. I've been there. I've prayed. 
You know, God hears desperate prayers. God hears prayers of spiritual warfare that are not conventional. And our, our, uh, our, war, our weapons are not conventional weapons, but they're strong weapons. I remember one morning, or one late one night, desperate, as one of my daughters was walking out, walking and left the home and was gone into the dark. I had no idea where, knowing that she was very resourceful, and she's not here today so I can say this, very resourceful and able to go wherever she wanted to go and always got in trouble. I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. I went down and went up in the little upper room in a little church in the town we were living in at that time. And I said, Lord, I am so desperate. You know where my daughter is. Your word says in Hebrews, the first chapter, the end of the, end of the chapter, it says that there are ministering angels, are ministering spirits sent to minister to those that are heirs of salvation. I'm an heir of salvation. She's an heir of salvation. I want you to send an angel out there, grab her and bring her home. I went back home, standing just inside the door. The door burst open. My daughter fell through the door. Her eyes were about that big around, and she said, Dad, an angel just stood at the door and welcomed me home. It wasn't my prayer because I was so desperate, but it was, it was the fact that I just got tired of the enemy doing stuff to us. I think when God's people start getting tired enough of it, start getting serious enough, we'll begin to take the Word of God and we'll begin to stand on it. We'll learn what our real true weapons are and we're going to go take a look at them and then we're going to quit here pretty soon. Let's look at 1 Timothy 1, 18. 1 Timothy 1, 18. If the new people will come back next week, I'll calm down and, be, and preach you a normal sermon, okay? <laughs> 1 Timothy 1.18 says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, but by them, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Paul told Timothy, Timothy, my son, you're going into ministry. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. Preach prosperity. Keep a smile on your face, and you'll soon be on TV. Uh, Paul said, you're looking at some shipwrecks. You're going to be beaten a few times, and you'll be stoned a couple times before it's over with, Timothy. Now, I want you to wage a good fight. I want you to get out there and do it God's way. I remember a little, a little prize fighter. I think I may have told this story, not, maybe not even too long ago. A little prize fighter from, from Ireland, right from Ireland. He said that he fought all the time he was growing up, and him and his dad used to go to the bar when he got old enough, and he said they'd go to the bar, and if they couldn't find anybody to fight, they'd fight with each other. And he said he grew up that way, and then he got saved, and he went to YWAM. And they said, and he said, they said we were going to go out on the streets, and he said, I was re eager for that, because he said, I like that kind of cr crowd. And he said, I'll tell you what you're going to do. He said, when they start heckling you and when they come up and start getting physical, you're going to drop down, cover, cover the other people, and that you're just going to hold there and wait until it's over. He said, there's no way. <laughs> he said, after the first couple of times when he'd taken on about six or seven, he finally, it finally dawned on him that he might try it their way. And he said that was even harder than doing it his own way. Sometimes it's even harder to do it God's way than it is to do it our way. Sometimes we even think we know what we should do, and we want to try and do it in our own way. This week, Buddy brought a scripture to me, a truth to me, and, and in that truth it said, don't try to work your own remedies. Don't try to work your own remedies. Let God take care of it. How many times do I lay awake at night, wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, figuring out how I'm going to make it happen, how I'm going to make it work? What I could say to this person, what I could say to that person, how I could fix this, how I could fix that. When I should be on my knees, 
crying out to God, holding that person up before the Lord for, for his mercy and his strength, and then coming against the enemy in true spiritual warfare and commanding him to take his hands off God's property and leave him alone because it, this is a time when God's people need to claim what's theirs. Okay, 1 Timothy, uh, that was just the first part. Of it. I want to read chapter 2. Therefore, I exert, I exhort first of all that all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority. Tough, isn't it? How many would like to have a prayer meeting for, uh, for President Obama? Uh, yeah. How many could pray with him, pray for him in a good way? <laughs> That'd be a little harder, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay, well, I realize that, I, I hope that most of us here understand that this isn't a time for, for us to be political, but it is a time for us to pray for our government and for those that are in power, for God to put those in power that should be in power and that our godly people and it will make a difference in our country. As long as Jesus tarries, I believe that God has a plan and that plan can very well be that for him to work out his best, even for America. I don't know how that will work because my Bible says that things are going to get worse. Worser. And that's okay because the end's in sight. Okay, let's look down here a little bit more. Uh, lead a uh, godly, uh, lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And then verse 8 says, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Paul said, I want every man, every woman, and every child, but every man in particular to stand to their feet and raise their hands and begin to pray a prayer that will make a difference. You know, I, I find myself, here recently I found myself praying. I never heard anything because I wasn't even praying out loud. I was praying in my mind. How many of you pray like that in your mind? Don't. Raise up your voice. I mean, it's okay to pray in your mind if you, if you have to, if, it's, if, it, if, if you can't talk or something, but if you're going to pray, pray. Pray out loud. And I'd say, the Bible says watch and pray. I'd say practice praying with your eyes open. Oh, I know, I know. I'm, I'm getting into heresy here right now. <laughs> there are those who believe that we should bow our heads, fold our hands, and close our eyes to when we pray. Can you imagine if I'm going to go into spiritual warfare, and I'm going to, or if I'm going to go into battle with, with, uh, with Jason? Jason, I'm going to go into battle with you. Would you bow your head, close your eyes, and fold your hands? <laughs> I'm going to hit you twice before you get your eyes open. <laughs> okay. That'd be a thought, though. If you're going to go into battle, you do, you do that. I don't think that would be real successful. But I think that's what God's people have been doing for many years. They've been bowing their heads, closing their eyes, and quietly mumbling to themselves a prayer. And I don't think the enemy's scared about that hardly at all. I don't think that scares him. He's not shaking in his boots over that. Now, there are those who pray and pray enough to where they don't have to shout. God hears them. I've heard Nancy pray many times, and I've never heard her get real excited and really loud. But I'll tell you what, God hears her when she prays. So I'm saying if you're in contact with God on a regular basis and you're praying enough, you do it the way God instructs you to do it. But if you're just getting started and you want to get into this battle, then let's do it with a little bit of, a little bit of zeal and a little bit of enthusiasm and get started and, and make a difference. 
And if we're men, let's be men and, and pray uh, prayers that would befit a man. Okay, Ephesians chapter 6. I'm, I'm running out, running down here. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 18. Seems I can find it here. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Some people are saying, Pastor, you've preached on praying before. We know we're supposed to pray. We're praying church. We pray every time we get together, we have prayer requests. And let me tell you, I'm not minimizing that one bit. I am so thankful for our prayer team, I, our, our prayer chain. I'm so thankful for our, our uh, praying people in this church. I'm thankful for the prayer requests. I'm thankful for the answers to prayer that we have seen so many times and that we're still seeing. And I'm thankful for every one of you that know how to pray and do pray. I'm challenging those of you who have the responsibility of your families and the responsibility of those that God has placed in your lives that you need to do spiritual warfare over. I'm challenging you to step to a different level. Let's step to a different level. I know you've been praying. I've been praying. I mumble a prayer in the morning and I mumble a prayer at noon. I mumble a prayer in the evening because I know Jesus is coming soon. I know the scripture or the song says whisper a prayer in the morning, whisper a prayer at noon. I've done that too. But I'm beginning to say it's time that we stand up and, and, and begin to say it like it is and begin to pray our prayers. To sum it all up, and I don't think I need to be dramatic or anything like that, but I'd just like to sum it up and say, we have been, as, a, as the church world, we've been losing ground. They're closing churches across our nation at an alarming rate. Sure, they're little churches. The big mega churches are still, maybe they're still preaching a good prosperity doctrine and got some people coming. But... The churches that are preaching that should be preaching the word of God have been losing ground and need to make a decision to enter the fight. It's coming to us whether we want it or not. It's coming to us whether we choose to get involved or we don't choose to get involved, it's still coming to us. The time that we're living in, all of the things that are going to happen that are t prophesied in the, end, in the end of my Bible, those things are going to happen. I may not like it, but it's still going to be there. I challenge you with this thought. If we don't act now, we will react later. If we don't take the Word of God and stand upon it, <laughs> Begin to pray earnestly, intercessory prayers and spiritual warfare. If we don't begin to do it now, it won't be very long as something more is taken away from us that we'll be reacting to it. Had a little thought, and I'll close with this thought, seriously. Had a little thought. The other day, as I was driving away from the shop up there, I'd had some stuff stolen. And that's a not unusual. I've had a lot of stuff stolen from there. Luckily for them, and for me too, it wasn't worth very much, because most, most of my stuff is not worth a lot. So if I have it stolen, it doesn't break my heart. But I was angry. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm gonna give all this stuff to God. I'm going to make it his, and if they steal from him, they're going to get it. <laughs> I figure if they're going to take it, they're going to be taking God's stuff, not mine. So I decided that if I'm going to do that, I'm going to lock the door on God's stuff because I want to be a good steward. So I locked the door, and I said, Lord, this stuff is yours. If they take it, it's yours. I feel bad if they take your stuff, 
but I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep over it because you can take care of your stuff. It took a big pressure off me, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen to those folks because I've lost a little bit of stuff since then. I would rather take action than I would react because my reaction is usually in the flesh and it's not a good way. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I'm not going to give a regular altar call. The altars are open when we're done, done with this prayer. You can come up here and, and pray as long as you want. You can earnestly intercede. You can do intercessory prayer. You can do spiritual warfare. However you want to do it, that's up to you. But I want to challenge you with this thought. If we are going to make a difference in our community, if this is a summer of decision when we're going to step to a different level in prayer and in seeking God, if that's the case, now is the time to make that decision. And as that young man walked away from me the other day, or yesterday morning, as he walked away, I thought, just like Jesus must have thought when the rich man, young ruler, walked away. So easy if he'd make the right decision. And I thought to myself, you know what? I can't make it happen, but I can intercede for God to reach that heart and for the enemy to lose his hold and for the strongholds in his life to be broken and tore down. I'm going to do that with God's help. As your heads are bowed and or, uh, <laughs> your eyes are closed, your hands are folded, I hope you're not uh, going to do spiritual warfare like that, but as we're just sitting here before God, whether you're looking around or whether your eyes are open or not, as we're sitting here before God, I'd like to just say, Holy Spirit, would you speak to our hearts? More than ever before, would you stir us on the inside so that we would become spiritual warriors ready to do battle on behalf of our families, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, on behalf of our neighbors and our friends, our family members, God, that we would hold them before you, and God, that it, you would even instruct us in the use of your weapons, that we would know how to pray, that we would know how to stand on your word, that we would look at the devil and do like Jesus did and quote the word to him and say, get your hands off. God, help us as we enter a different phase as we, a more intense time of spiritual warfare and help us to step up and do our part in Jesus' name. Amen.